Hi, so today um, I want to look at Yiddish literature in post-war Poland, and I want to focus on the materiality of some, some of the documents that were produced in this time period right after the Holocaust, so that we can think about the ways in which materiality can be a window into thinking about cultural reconstruction and the ways in which different actors, different figures are sort of negotiating political and social conditions in order to create a new body of material that can start to compensate for things like cultural loss, but also to map a future for a new idea about what Jewish life could look like in Europe after the war. So structure the conversation. I wanna think about how in the immediate post-war years, there are a lot of people and things moving in and out of Poland. This is a very porous time where refugees, Jewish refugees who had spent the war years in the Soviet Union return to Poland. Some people who are in Poland leave Poland, um, going often to Germany to displaced persons camps from which they continued on to other places. And how this period is also characterized by a lot of foreign aid coming into Poland, um, especially in the Jewish sphere, thinking of organizations that are trying to do reconstruction and aid work. So this is um, the very immediate post-war context, followed by a period of centralization, both politically and socially, as the communist government takes hold after 1947, and especially by 1949. And finally, I want to look at the Stalinist years, the sort of period of kind of intense centralization of the Jewish cultural sphere and the ways in which this also, um, on one hand, seems like a closing of this porousness, but how we can see through different document evidence that actually there was still a way in which different exchanges between East and West were possible, even during the Cold War, in regards especially to Yiddish literature. So to begin, really, I want to position us in Warsaw in 1945. This picture on the left here is of the former Jewish quarter, which was completely destroyed, very much leveled by the Nazis. And the condition of Jewish life in Poland is mirrored in the condition of Jewish books. So Rachel Auerbach, who is a cultural activist, a historian herself, she writes about this encounter she has with the city and with the, the spaces, with the culture, with, with everything that she's viewing. And she writes about how in the case of Jewish books, tens of thousands of volumes of the collected works of the classics once wandered throughout the state of Poland, but are now scattered. Today, after long and hard searching, we may perhaps collect at most two or three sets. Only on the garbage dumps of small towns are there sometimes soiled, rain-soaked pages, side by side with the damaged pages of sacred books. And so, in thinking about the way that Rachel Auerbach characterizes these books, there's a real parallel being made between Jewish bodies, Jewish books, the way in which the lack of Jewish books is also a reminder of this recent, very violent past. And the books themselves have been desecrated, have been scattered, much like people. And sort of completing this image is the way in which David Spard, another cultural activist who we'll hear from a few times today, he talks about his work in creating Yiddish literature in this context, that for him, Yiddish literature was akin to meeting the need for food, for a home, that, quote, steps were immediately taken to meet a spiritual thirst for the Yiddish word. So that these are the two kind of um, beginning moments here in which Yiddish literature is uh, an issue that is being immediately addressed right after liberation. So today we're going to look at some of these efforts from a material perspective, as I mentioned, at the intersection of printing technology and of politics, both global and inside of Poland. So to frame this even more so in this material sense, I just wanna point out the ways in which technologies of the time were very physical. So this here is um, on the left, an example of hand setting a movable type. 
On the right are cases of Yiddish type that were used to publish um, newspapers. And these type cases are extremely heavy and they're very physical. And somebody has to put each individual letter together to create a line of type. And I mention this so that when we look at this newspaper, Dosnaya Levin, New Life, which was the first Yiddish newspaper published in liberated Poland, we can think about the ways in which labor is deeply entwined with the creation of these new publications. And so this is an example of a handset newspaper. And I wanna zoom in here to look at these two columns because even though these two columns are right next to one another on the front page of this paper, we can really see some interesting differences between them that demonstrate much more of the conditions of cultural creation at this time. So if we zoom in and we focus on one single kind of letter, this is the Lamed, the L letter in Hebrew and in Yiddish. You can see that on the right, the Lamed has a sort of curled top. And on the left, the Lamed is straight up. And these are, between the two columns, they're different, but within the columns themselves, they're very consistent, which demonstrates that these are two different cases of type that two different typesetters are putting together. Maybe they're standing next to each other in the same print shop, but these inconsistencies demonstrate that there is a lack of, of, of enough type of one kind that can be used effectively to make this single newspaper. And not only that, if you look at some of the other examples of this very same letter, this top, which is either curly or straight, is in most cases broken off entirely. And this is because of the way that the lamed is above the line, it is susceptible to breaking off if the type itself is overused. If the individual sort um, is used quite a bit, it can be susceptible to damage. So this shows us that not only is there a mixed use of type from different sources, but also the type itself is broken, it's old, it's being used um, as much as it can be. And this is specifically interesting because in 1946, the International Workers Organization, the communist organization, and in particular, the Jewish section, they write to the heads of the Sinai Latin with an offer that they are going to send a linotype to Poland along with the matrices needed to create a newspaper to create the lines of type that they can use. And this is revolutionary because one machine can replace the labor of around six hand setters, which makes it cheaper, makes it easier to create more frequent issues of newspapers. It also frees up the type itself so that the newspaper can be made with the linotype, can come out more frequently, and that the people who would normally have been setting each individual letter for the newspaper can focus on making new kinds of publications. And if we see, this is a later issue of Disney 11, we can see that this is a linotype set version and the type is clearer, crisper, and um, no broken lamids. But we can see if we zoom way close, <laughs> zoom in, you can see that there are different extraneous marks in between many of the letters which demonstrates that a lot of these slugs, these little metal pieces that the linotype makes, many of them were dirty, which is to say they had extraneous pieces of metal that were the inside of the, of the matrices of the molds, which demonstrates that these linotype, um, the linotype was really used quite a bit and not properly maintained. So even though this enabled there to be much more print material to be created, it also was another thing that was in short supply. Now, as I mentioned, having a linotype enabled the press to create new materials. So starting in 1947, Dosnai Levin issued books for the first time. And these are two of the very first books issued by Dosnai Levin, which in their own ways, demonstrates particular mandates of the press and of cultural figures at the time. On the left is the book Ghetto Kingdom, 
This is one of the very, very first examples of what we now understand to be called Holocaust literature. It's a collection of short stories about Jewish life in the war, in the, excuse me, in the Wuj ghetto. And this book was in part created because of this initiative to remember and to sort of create authentic, but also aesthetic testimony that recalled the experiences of Jews during the Holocaust. Now on the right by Leib Olitsky is a book, Man Will Be Good. This is a book of um, parables, little stories, mostly for children, with the idea that this book would represent the other attitude of the press, which was that the mission is not only to recall the experiences that had just happened, but also to build a new Poland and a new Jewish Poland in particular, so that people could rebuild their lives and think about something new. So these are the two um, pillars of the this press in 1947. And these books themselves, they're made on really bad paper, full of lignin, ground wood, very ephemeral in their actual qualities. And this is another demonstration of the ways in which shortages are also on display in the print material of the time. In thinking about this context, we can also start to wonder, given that there was such a shortage of physical materials, of printing, of, of, of type, of a linotype, of people who could set things, who and what gets published in this context? And as Dovid Svard comments here in his memoir about the time, he, he accurately mentions this idea that all writers possess a thirst to be printed, but ultimately not everybody has the merit to be printed. And in this context especially, those who were printed were often socially and politically connected to those in charge. And from 1947, increasingly, this meant people who were communist, officially communist in their political outlook and their affiliation, and also connected to the Yiddish speaking, Yiddish activist communists who were placed at the head of the state supported Yiddish press. And so David Svard being chief among them. And this led to a kind of self censorship insofar as many of the materials that were published in the early 50s to the mid 50s, certainly the time of high Stalinism, were ideologically mandated. As we see in the book here on the right, in Land of Racial Discrimination from 1953, there were materials that were anti-American in their outlook, as well as materials that were trying to connect the Yiddish book press, which became this new unified centralized single press, they were trying to put this press on the global map that connected it to other presses worldwide in the Yiddish sense. On the left, for example, is a book by Yitzhak Turkov Grudberg. And the Turkov family was very well known uh, for their participation in the Yiddish theater and how that stretched in a transnational way to different contexts in the Americas, in Israel and elsewhere. And so publishing him as well at this time was also a way in which the press was demonstrating its active engagement with these networks. And we can also see the visual language that's being communicated here with these very beautiful covers created by the same illustrator, Itzik Reisman. Now, given the in the 50s, we have a lot of political incidents happening in which Cold War politics are really starting to solidify, and especially to solidify boundaries between the East and the West. It is all the more so surprising that the Yiddish book press, the Yiddish press in Poland, is, continues to have communication with and also active participation with organizations for example, in New York. So this is a magazine from the ECUF, which is a Jewish communist organization. This particular branch is in New York. And their entire issue here, the back cover has this huge amount of space dedicated to promoting the works of the Yiddish press in Poland. And they are selling the Yiddish book 
publications to their own readers in the West. So this is a way in which, even though officially, exchanges between East and West are not sanctioned, there are ways in which these books are reaching a global audience beyond the Eastern Bloc. And it's not only in one direction, but we see here in this letter from 1950 that the editors of the Yiddish book press request books from Ikuf in New York, Ikuf's own publications, books that they themselves are not able to produce that they do not have, so that they can have these for their personal libraries, but also as source material for their own new publications. And just in our last few minutes, I wanna show a little comparison between some of these books. So the books on the right are from New York. These are from Ikuf. The books on the left are the same books in terms of their material, um, the content really, but they are produced by Poland, uh, by the Yiddish book press in Poland in Warsaw. And so the significance of these books in particular is also very important because this is the collected works of Mendele, Mendele Moichers Forum, who's considered the grandfather of Yiddish literature. And for those in this young press in Poland, this was a huge honor to be able to publish this work because of the ways in which this would solidify their press as participating in this ongoing chain of Yiddish cultural creation. We see the books on the right, they're hardback, they're austere, they're um, very serious. Whereas the books on the left, they are made out of uh, cardboard covers. The, again, the visual language is more in keeping with that of the other um, publications in the press. And the illustrator is the same actually of these as those that I previously showed. And this is also an interesting thing in thinking about how they were created. So in the opening pages of the books and the publication information, on the right, the ECUF mentions very explicitly that these books were financed by donors, in this case, donors from Mexico City, who has de have dedicated this particular volume to the memory of their parents. Whereas the book on the left from Poland is financed by the government, there's no need for philanthropy to create these kinds of materials. And yet there is a big difference in thinking about what it means to be a cultural activist. Those on the right, these financiers from Mexico, they're explicitly named here as cultural activists for their participation by giving money. Whereas those on the left, the books on the left rather, the editors are named of course, um, and the bureaucracy and the different aspects of getting paper, getting materials to create these books is mentioned in a legalistic kind of way, but the actual material labor that enabled this book to be created is not mentioned. And to be honest, also in the example on the right, the typesetters, those kinds of individual actors are also left unnamed. So this sort of leaves us with a question about what it takes to create culture and to create, recreate, or develop something in the wake of something so catastrophic as genocide, and how on one hand, a diaspora comes to fill that void and work together with refugees to think about creating new things, um, and also the ways that the local and global politics are also intertwined in these efforts. So thank you very much. And I look forward to speaking further during our question session. Thank you.